Welcome everyone uh, for joining us this evening for the December WAPA event. Just real quick, I want to make sure that people can hear me. I just can people hear? Awesome. Okay, I got some thumbs up. Awesome. Fantastic. My name is Monica Gomez Isaac. I serve currently as the program uh, chair for this calendar year for WAPA, and we're very excited for this evening's event. Once again, we're focusing on uh, another uh, speaker who joins us transatlantically, uh, Dr. Friederike Miet. Uh, she is based out of Berlin, Germany, and she is not only a respected colleague, but also a great friend. So um, before we turn it over to Dr. Miet, uh, we're going to look specifically at her background, which this evening's uh, theme for tonight is Reflections on Resilience and coping in the aftermath of mass violence. Now, one of the reasons we decided to uh, choose this particular theme is because, as we all know, currently our global society is experiencing a great deal of unrest as well as uh, instability, whether it be socially, uh, whether it be in regards to this very uh, egregious or terrible pandemic, but also economically. And so, when we're dealing with very heavy subjects like this, we don't want to just strictly uh, focus on the gloom and doom, but we want to also share how the human spirit is absolutely resilient. And that, that trait, that characteristic spans across time, it spans across space as well as culture. So uh, what better guest to have than uh, someone who specializes on this, on this topic? Dr. Meath uh, will share some of her findings from her research specifically on Sierra Leone, but other regions of the world, where she investigated how ordinary citizens coped with very difficult circumstances. She will discuss how imagination, hope, religious beliefs, self-regulation, and other individual and collective strategies helped people from Sierra Leone and other places cope with their experiences and live in peaceful coexistence after a major traumatic event or conflict. So for a more general level, she looks at how human beings can draw on existing resources to deal with such extreme situations. And we believe that such uh, observations will be very insightful as they are rather timely to see how thinking and talking about people affected by traumatic circumstances uh, can actually give us a greater insight in how to um, understand circumstances of vulnerability and use, by identifying those factors, use them in strategies and strengths to build upon. So I'm not going to take any more time uh, other than to quick um, give a, um, a small background on her, uh, Dr. Meath. Uh, her current research is on conflict transformation. Her research has focused on perceptions of violence and dealing with the past and the impact of trans transitional justice, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. She's the co-editor of Transitional Justice Theories, as well as the German Compensation Program for Forced Labor, which is Practices and Experiences. She was a fellow at American University here in Washington, D.C., where I got to know her better, and also uh, with Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. She holds a Ph.D. in conflict excuse me, in social and cultural anthropology and peace and conflict studies from Philips University in Marburg, Germany. Uh, she's currently uh, working to found an organization that promotes reflective approaches in her research and practice. So I'm going to talk, uh, turn it over to Dr. Meet. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and it's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, and thank you all uh, for this great opportunity to share some of my research and to also meet you and meet the, the WAPA uh, organization as association. Um, uh, so this is this was very humbling, a very humbling introduction uh, by Monica, and I'm not yet sure how I will draw this link from my research to how we can deal with the current situations. I think this is what we're going to have to do, all of us together in the discussion, perhaps afterwards. Um, uh, it's uh, 
I wanted to say a few things about myself uh, because I'm not so much an academic anymore, I think, than the way you announced it. Um, so uh, I've dabbled a little bit back and forth between being an anthropologist, uh, studying anthropology in Amsterdam and then working for the UN and being fed up with that and then doing a PhD in Germany and then being, you know, not fitting into this academic system anymore and then uh, doing uh, some consultancy work, uh, but also not being able to let go of the research. So I'm pretty much uh, torn between this practical and research work. And Monica, I think you've uh, announced it now, uh, but uh, I think the, the, the accumulation of this is that together with a colleague and dear friend, uh, her name is Maya Ninadovic, um, we are founding a, a consultancy called Reflectory, which will uh, help partners in uh, developing reflective approaches in research and practice. So this is basically where I am right now. So this is a, a very exciting time in my life. So it's also very nice to meet anthropologists who are in the practical and professional world. So that's uh, very great. Um, so thank you again um, for this opportunity. And before I begin, um, I uh, just want to make a, a, a couple of disclaimers. Um, so this was a, this is a really nice opportunity for me to think about some aspects of my research um, that are a little while ago. I haven't talked about this resilience aspects for some time, but this last year has uh, brought this topic up uh, again so many times with the pandemic uh, and also I facing a personal situation and, and, and I just thought about resilience for this entire year a lot and uh, so this is a, a really good end of the year to start you know to think um, you know what what actually happened and how you know how can we go on and perhaps uh, also find some pieces of hope uh, to to go on um, but also another thing that I wanted to um, say before I start talking about Sierra Leone is that uh, um, one of the reasons I also haven't uh, talked so much uh, uh, about my academic research in, in, uh, in the past couple of years is also that I feel increasingly more uncomfortable talking about uh, research that I've done in, in Sierra Leone. So this is something that is a very um, new sentiment that I'm discussing a lot of, with my colleague here, that it just doesn't feel uh, comfortable anymore to have gone to a, a place as an outsider and then coming back and then being an expert on a certain topic. And it's, uh, I don't have a solution to that. I just want to share that I feel uncomfortable about that and I don't know how to solve this. Uh, not doing research is also not what, uh, sh what I think is the solution here. So whenever I say or talk about Sierra Leoneans or when I talk about people and, and research participants, it's, it's something that uh, I'm not sure yet how to find the right words. So I just want to say something like this up front. Um, but let me start. Uh, I uh, want to give you a little bit of context on uh, both Sierra Leone as a uh, country, a the, the little bit of the history of this mass violence that took place there, and also of the research that I uh, conducted. Um, Sierra Leone is in West Africa, Western Africa. It's English speaking and it's a very small country. It's uh, the size of South Carolina. Uh, so it's, and it's now there are seven million people living there and during the time of the war it was about five million people so it's, it's a very small country which also means that it's a very tight or tight-knit society I don't know if you can say it like that <laughs> and um, uh, there was a civil war uh, that took place between 1991 and 2002 and um, this was a, a little bit of a peculiar conflict uh, in that it was a civil war, but it wasn't really an uh, ideological um, conflict between two sides. It was uh, more of a conflict that um, started as a very 
localized violence by a, a small rebellious or rebel, uh, rebel yeah, a rebel group. And this initially localized violence completely got out of hand. And um, so uh, this started in, in 1991. And uh, um, uh, there was a small group of, of fighters who entered Sierra Leone from the neighboring country, uh, Liberia. And they, uh, the reason for this rebellion was stated that they wanted to overthrow the government um, because of them being corrupt and not, you know, servicing uh, civilians. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, but they didn't overthrow the government as they said they attacked villages and civilians and so this was a, 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 an event that kind of out of a lack of response of the government got out of hand so i'm, I'm really simplifying this in a very uh, uh yeah severe way <laughs> but i want to explain um the kind of violence also on a local level uh later on uh, other armed groups entered this conflict or were formed. And uh, the co a common characteristic of the violence in Sierra Leone was that it um, uh, was turned to civilians, uh, so that civilians by multiple armed groups were attacked. Uh, and in some places, these were uh, uh, hit and run attacks, um, so that even to this day, uh, when you speak to some people in uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, they would not know who attacked them during the civil war. Uh, and then in other places, uh, uh, the violence was more uh, localized in that uh, uh, armed groups settled in villages and captured uh, civilians. Um, Another factor that played into this chaotic scenario was uh, the uh, that natural resources, and maybe you might have heard about, you know, the diamonds in uh, in Sierra Leone uh, have played a role in prolonging the conflict and making it more uh, chaotic, as groups were uh, um, fighting for access to diamond fields, uh, and also the one more thing that I want to say about the type of conflict is that the violence was uh, very brutal and in some parts also uh, unimaginable or un not, uh, not understandable. Uh, um, you might have heard about child soldiers being used and uh, they've given, they, they were given drugs. And um, so that many of the people who I talked with afterwards uh, would uh, call this a senseless violence. So uh, it would be attacked by, by children and it, it just wouldn't make sense. Um, so in, in the end, the violence has spread through the entire country. Almost all of the civilians were in some way affected by the violence and um, uh, some by displacement and some have lost loved ones and uh, uh, many uh, people were killed, more than 50,000 uh, people were killed over 10 years. And the conflict ended by a peace agreement um, uh, between the main rebel group and the government. And um, it has been peaceful ever since. So um, this is a little bit of a mini description of, of the conflict and uh, uh, the research that um, I uh, want to share today is, uh, took place between uh, the years 2009 and 2013, and this was basically my, my PhD research. Um, it was part of a larger uh, a research group where we looked at four post-conflict countries uh, and wanted to understand the impact of certain peace building instruments, uh, things like uh, war tribunals, truth commissions, uh, or reconciliation initiatives. And we wanted to understand how uh, their impact, uh, how the impact they had in, in society. But when I uh, started doing field work in Sierra Leone, and this is between 2010 and, to, and 2012, I uh, conducted field work in Sierra Leone in total eight months. Uh, the first time I went there for five months and then for three months. Um, one thing that I immediately noticed was that uh, when I spoke with 
uh, with uh, Sierra Leoneans, they they um, they did not show that much interest anymore in these institutions. So I came about ten years after the civil war uh, had ended, and the there had been a war crimes tribunal that already took place. There had been a truth commission that had taken place. But when I talked with people, they said. Well, yes, all of this has taken place, uh, but uh, we we rather want to move on now. This has happened. It, it's okay. We want to move on. And I found it in, intriguing uh, that I thought uh, this is, you know, relatively short after the war and people seem to not be that interested uh, in these institutions. Uh, or that there wasn't even a controversy about the work of these institutions. And uh, so the, my main research question became this, uh, okay, well then how, how are people dealing with the past of this uh, brutal uh, civil war in everyday life? Uh, and how are they doing this as individuals? And it almost became a, a psychological research question that I, that I wondered how as a human being, you know, can you live through these kind of experiences uh, and then, um, uh, you know, move on or uh, live your life. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the research question. So for the remainder of um, today's uh, talk, I would like to share some of the findings uh, that um, I made. And um, I hope that they can lead to some interesting discussions. Uh, at the end of it, I also want to talk about uh, this term resilience, which can be good or uh, um, more problematic. Um, but let me uh, start with uh, some of the, the findings. And um, the first uh, topic that I would like to talk about um, uh, is um, something that psychologists call self-regulation. I did not know about this term when I did my uh, research, but this is basically what describes it really well. And it is an individual strategy to cope with um, uh, experiences of, of suffering. Um, uh, so in my discussions in Sierra Leone, um, oh, I'm realizing I have not showed you a few of my pictures. Uh, to give you one more context of my research is uh, I would like to show you uh, the three research locations that I spent um, uh, the time in. Um, so uh, my the way how I went about my research was not the typical anthropological way of staying in one location for the entire uh, time uh, but to uh, be in th I wanted to get three different uh, more perspectives uh, so I uh, spent time in three main research locations one is in the north of the country called uh, Medina it's a small village uh, just to give you a few uh, um, impressions of that uh, area. Uh, here is uh, the only picture where we have uh, ourselves in action. Um, and the, uh, the, the second research location um, is called Tombodu, which is in the east of Sierra Leone, which was uh, a harder hit region during the civil war because it is in the diamond producing region. And here um, uh, some of the armed groups uh, really captured uh, or put them, settled themselves there for a few years and captured civilians and really maltreated civilians uh, in that location. And the third uh, main research location uh, is the cap was the capital Freetown. Uh, which is about has about one to two million people who live there and uh, uh, towards the end of the war and that is where uh, a few of the attacks very strong attacks happened in uh, in Freetown so just a few images of that uh, to give you a little bit of an of an idea of um, or some impressions of how it looks like 
Um, so my, um, let me stop this for a moment. So when I talked with um, Sierra Leoneans in all of these, these locations, I noticed how there was, there were some ideas that um, uh, there was this idea of not um, dwelling too much on, on the past, which people thought would be something that is helpful. So it was, uh, you know, we would talk about their experiences, um, uh, what happened in, uh, in, in during the Civil War and how this affected them in their everyday life now. But there would always be a moment during the interview where the person would tell me, yes, uh, but it is not good to dwell too much on the past, or it is not good to think, this was the word that they used, to think too much about the past, or to think, or to get into too much thinking, uh, which is not good, it will make you feel bad. So um, this is uh, something that, uh, and then they try to explain to me how they try not to think too much. So it is uh, almost like a rerouting of, your, of, the, of the thinking that, that you're doing. Uh, for example, uh, a person, um, let me, well, let me uh, give you an example of a, a person who I met. Uh, I would want to call her Adama. And she, uh, we talked in the interview about her having a really horrible experience fleeing her village. Um, then she was captured by rebels and she was really maltreated by them. And then she escaped uh, from them and uh, managed to flee all the way to Freetown where she found refuge in, in a camp there that was set up. And when we talked with her, uh, this was she was still living in that former refugee camp that had then transformed into a settlement. And so she was telling us this entire story. Uh, she was blind uh, because of the things that they they did to her. Um, but then she said, uh, "When I think of this," uh, and she, she was talking about her husband who had passed away. It wasn't entirely clear whether he was killed or whether he passed away. And she would say, uh, when I think of it too much, it, it just makes me feel bad. So I try to think about it sometime and then I stop myself. And then uh, I encourage myself or when I think of it, I encourage myself. And at the moment with all of the interpretation and translation, I thought that she said, I, dis I discouraged, I get discouraged from thinking about it. And uh, so we had a little bit of back and forth and uh, she said, no, no, I encourage myself. And we asked how she did that. And then she would say, I focus on how I'm able to feed, I focus on what I do now. I'm able to feed my children. Uh, I'm able to work and I'm able to uh, provide for this family. So this is what encourages me. So it's, this is an example of um, trying to refocus uh, one's attention to things that are under our own control. So that is sort of something that uh, um, is helping her to uh, place uh, what has happened to her into a context of today uh, that shows her able to provide for a family. And I think this is also something that um, is situated in a, a larger social and cultural uh, environment. Um, um, what I thought about a lot uh, during my research was um, how ideas or attitudes about suffering and about how strong or weak a person is, um, such ideas uh, that are shared in wider society, how they can shape a person's uh, own view of how strong or how capable they are. Um, and here, um, what is really interesting is the work by uh, Summerfield and uh, also David Bracken. Uh, I, I can share this if, if anyone's interested, um, who um, have noticed or who are pointing out that um, there's almost a notion uh, in a lot of Western societies that um, we cannot go through something traumatic, uh, potentially traumatic, without professional help. And uh, this isn't 
the case uh, in all societies. So it, there are expectations, you know, in many societies people are expected to be uh, a lot stronger and to be able to adapt to adversity. And um, uh, in Sierra Leone, I many times had the idea that there was this wider expectation that it is okay for people to deal with this uh, experiences and to um, be able on a psychological level to deal with them. And uh, people never talked about themselves or few times talked about themselves uh, uh, using words like that they're vulnerable or that they're victims of, uh, of the, the former combatants or of the, the violence. Uh, so um, uh, I wanted to give you an, an example that has nothing to do with the violence of the civil war, but that kind of was a, a moment where I realized these expectations existed. Um, one time I was uh, at a befriended family's house. This was in Freetown. And uh, there was a small child. Uh, she was three years old or four years and she had just lost her mother. Uh, so her mother passed away two weeks ago. It was two weeks prior. And um, in the household was uh, her aunt as well, and she was taking care of the child now. And we were sitting there, excuse me, we were sitting there as a group, and uh, this child saw her aunt and called out, Auntie, Auntie, and said something, you know, was running after her. And one of the elder women uh, remarked uh, that to the aunt, uh, she's still calling you Auntie. And she meant that she's uh, not calling her mother yet. And, uh, and I found it really remarkable because it was such a short time after the mother had passed away. And yet there was this idea that the child can adapt or the child will, will adapt to the new situation. Uh, so these, those are just these small little moments where I realized that um, there are these notions that exist that uh, people can adapt. Um, one of the, uh, in, in my research, uh, one of the more difficult um, topics was um, uh, this, uh, the issue of coexistence, uh, how to make sense of having to live together with former combatants. And uh, this, this was a huge uh, topic, obviously, in, in the research, as in some locations, uh, it wasn't entirely clear if some of the young men in the village were actually combatants or not. And in other places, like in Tombodu, the second uh, research location, uh, there were a lot of former combatants who simply remained living there after the civil war. And uh, this was known to some people. Some people were, would have remained in the village during the war and they would know that these were the former combatants and they would you know, see themselves being forced to live with them in, in, the same, uh, in the same village. And this was also that this was difficult, was uh, uh, obviously talked about a lot in, in our interviews. So people would say, you know, whenever I see them, it would make me feel bad. Um, or they, it, it, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, of, of the war. Um, but then there was this but always in, in, in the sentence, uh, but you just have to adjust or you, uh, we try to forget. Um, and one uh, woman actually said it, or for me that always meant or showed how, how difficult this was. She said, you have to, um, you cannot forget, but you have to forget. So she was kind of phrasing it this way. Um, but this, people made sense of this situation uh, with a few strategies. Uh, so on one hand, they tried to rationalize uh, this or they had some ideas about how this would still be okay. Um, for example, there was this idea of justice that um, whatever the um, former combatants did during, to, during uh, the, the war, 
uh, they will still meet their justice. So there were some ideas of, you know, religious ideas that, you know, God will deal with them. Um, there will be, um, you know, the, the, some kind of karma. Um, they, uh, they will find their justice. Um, and some people, um, and I have to say here, maybe this, uh, I need to explain this a little bit. Um, some of the, or most of the former combatants um, were uh, young men that didn't necessarily have a high social status. So this is not, this was not an issue of um, people be feeling threatened by, uh, by former combatants, but uh, some of them actually had a rather low uh, status. So uh, some people uh, of the civilians, they would say, well, uh, that is uh, the karma that meets them now. They are suffering from uh, effects of the drug use during the war. They didn't really have an education and, uh, and now they are struggling. So it's a kind of a, a karma that uh, they, they are experiencing because they, were, they did something that they were not supposed to do. Um, Another strategy to deal with this difficult uh, difficulty to coexist uh, was also that people saw themselves not so much as individuals or as victims, but they saw themselves as a member of, of a community. And as a member of a community, you have to ensure that um, they can live together, that there can be sort of a, coexist a peaceful coexistence. So they would say that even though they don't feel um, well about the situation, they would behave in an appropriate way. They would greet one another. Uh, they would say hello when it's expected to say hello uh, so that the community can live together. So um, uh, this, this was another way of how ordinary life uh, uh, was, was possible in, in those locations. Um, and uh, so I want to come to uh, uh, an aspect that I think is one of the uh, really interesting findings of the research. Um, uh, the, this role of imagination and the role of the future in, in general in, 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 this, uh, in, in these situations. And uh, one of the most striking uh, uh, findings or observations that I made was that uh, in these discussions about coexistence, something that emerged was that people uh, had a certain uh, uh, imagination uh, in mind, which was the, this topic of uh, development. So that they said, um, we have to live together now so that in the future Sierra Leone or our um, uh, community can have development. So this was an imagination that they, um, that they were uh, kind of uh, having in, in, uh, in their mind um, or that kind of popped up again and again in, in my research data that uh, this goal of development was helping people uh, uh, to uh, live in coexistence and to sort of be in the situation and to withstand it. Uh, and this narrative of development is really interesting because this was something that was shared in all research locations. Uh, uh, both in the ones where the war had uh, more of an effect uh, and also in the ones where there was less uh, of the violence. And um, it allowed people to talk in a more inclusive way. Uh, for example, uh, some of the, the uh, research respondents would say, well, in the end, the former combatants, they would like to have development and we would like to have development. So basically they are suffering and we are suffering and we all want development. So this was kind of a rationalization that it was okay to live in coexistence even though it was difficult, um, but there was a kind of a common goal. And uh, we've also found that um, there were even ideas of empathy uh, there. 
that people, um, uh, in most of the research respondents were, were civilians, and they uh, would say, well, actually, maybe some of the former combatants, they joined the fight because they didn't have any other chance and they didn't have any other perspective and they did this to um, earn a living or to uh, survive. So, uh, and now what they want is to provide for their families or what they want is to have development as well. So there was this kind of uh, an, an understanding that they uh, uh, showed uh, toward the, the other. Uh, in the in the community and I think this uh, and this is also in Sierra Leone I mean I've talked about this very everyday way of, of dealing with the past or of coping but this was also something that was um, where sort of the top-down approach and the bottom-up uh, approach uh, uh, where they met in Sierra Leone because this is also something that uh, in, in political discourse would be uh, emphasized a lot. So we want development and this is why we as a country um, are um, living in peaceful coexistence. And I think this is something that we often um, don't um, uh, focus on too much. Uh, very often uh, when we do this research on dealing with the past, we try to understand what has happened in the past and how does it um, affect uh, people's present uh, um, feelings or their present way of, of, of coping. But uh, I thought a lot in Sierra Leone during that research, uh, I thought a lot about how actually your present uh, influences how you view uh, the past. And uh, I think here it's important to um, understand that at the time of, of my research, uh, which was about 10 years after the last large scale violence took place in Sierra Leone, um, that it was a very hopeful time uh, in, in the country's post-war history. It was the first time where some development projects had taken off, where there was an idea of hope that perhaps now uh, on an economic level the country will uh, see some socio-economic development and uh, there, were, there had been a new government come into uh, the force uh, in 2007 and people put high high hopes on this on this government to bring development so there was an overall hopeful atmosphere during the time when i uh, conducted this research and I think this all influenced this narrative of development and this idea of the future, uh, which at that certain moment uh, uh, in time uh, also influenced how people viewed the past and how people saw this senseless violence uh, and how they interpreted it uh, in, in their lives. And I think this is uh, something that um, we um, this uh, sort of having this purpose uh, and having this hope or having this you know point uh, in the future in sight uh, why am i doing this and why am i um, going through the suffering uh, this is a very important point uh, uh, to um, keep in mind when we look at post-conflict societies as well so what is actually the role of the future in dealing with the past so this was uh, one of my um a very fruitful way to uh, think about the situation um i would like to um come or draw this a little bit together with um this term or the concept of of resilience um let me drink a little bit of coffee <laughs> Mm. Um, I've, I've had um, uh, my, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit divided about the concept of resilience. Uh, the good, the advantage of using a word like resilience, a concept like resilience is that it shifts the focus to what is there. It shifts the focus to the strength 
of um, uh, to or that shifts the focus to resources and it 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 it, uh, it asks us to look at what is already there so when i look at the strategies that uh, i've just described and many others uh, in in by the research respondents it can show us the individual and social dimensions of coping and of um, uh, dealing with the past and um, uh, this is what a concept like resilience is very good for um, but these are not um, static things so dealing with the past changes over time and a word like resilience uh, kind of sounds like it's a state that you can be in or out and it, it, it's very uh, how can I explain this one time I uh, held a presentation in, in South Africa and uh, also about uh, my research in Sierra Leone and uh, one of the uh, persons in the audience, uh, she was uh, a survivor of the apartheid regime of the violence there. And she said, <clears throat> okay, now great. Now I have to decide whether I have a trauma or whether I'm resilient. Uh, I don't, I don't want to make this decision, right? So the resilience can have this this uh, words like resilience they can they can you know um uh, they, they sound like a state that you're either in or out so one of the um reflections that i would like to share here but maybe this is also something that we can talk about as a group is that um things like trauma and resilience they're not um a date uh, that is steady but these are changing and um, they can be changing in uh, for example by a season in a seasonal way it's not a linear way so um, uh, how to explain this <laughs> um, uh, for example uh, in Sierra Leone uh, in Freetown uh, there were one large attack that happened was in 1999 and it was on January 6th and um, whenever there was January people uh, were telling me well now this is a time where I don't feel good about moving on this is a time when I'm reminded of the war when I'm reminded of the people who pass away and the heavy fighting in, in Freetown in the streets and it, it, it was uh, kind of like a seasonal kind of, I don't want to say depression, but it was a, a really a, a point where people reflected a lot on, on the war. And then, on, uh, so on other times, this wouldn't be so present. So many times during the year, people would say, we would like to forget about this. And then th there's this one trigger that seasonally comes back and reminds people of, of the past. So, it's very hard to talk about trauma and resilience like this. It's just kind of like the ups and ups and downs uh, in, within uh, the year. Um, but also we need to think about a greater context um, uh, of this research as well. I've, um, for example, I've uh, uh, spent time in the country during uh, uh, a time that was uh, characterized by this overall hope and this hopeful atmosphere and people could um, go about their lives uh, um, um, in, a, in a fairly, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to say normal way, but <laughs> there was uh, an overall uh, potentiality in the air that things could happen and uh, development could come. And a few years later, uh, you might have uh, heard there's, uh, there was the Ebola crisis. And during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, there was a lot of corruption that happened. And then people, uh, sort of some of these older topics started coming back up again. And then people said, well, this is now just like it was before the war. We have all of this corrupt uh, uh, government and uh, uh, we have learned nothing from the war and from the violence. So some of these uh, things also have to be seen in a greater context and things that happened uh, that happen in, in the present can, uh, or how they change in the present, they can also change how we see the past and what we, we get from the past. And um, 
So I think these are some of the uh, some examples of how this can does not always have to it's not always a static uh, thing. And finally, I think uh, it's also something that I would like to share, uh, uh, which is a, a, a more personal point of view. Uh, we also have to understand our own role in in the research and in how our research questions come about. And um, the topic of resilience, uh, without knowing the concept back at the time, but having this in mind, is also something that has always fascinated me. It has always fascinated me as a person to understand how people um, uh, 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 deal with adversity. Uh, but the question we should ask ourselves is how we uh, perform or how we conduct the research that we conduct if we don't have an underlying bias there that I might have talked with um, a lot of people who s seem to be more resilient. Um, uh, and because this is something that interests me uh, uh, personally. So I think there's also a, a lot of uh, uh, topics that we can talk about how these underlying personal biases also shape the, the way how we do research and what kind of questions we, we uh, grapple with while, while we are uh, doing our field work and uh, later analysis. So I think um, I want to kind of give this or open this up into the, the room. Uh, perhaps if you have questions about the research uh, in Sierra Leone or about the case in Sierra Leone, I'm uh, more than happy to answer that, but also maybe we can just have a more open discussion about how useful a concept like resilience is, how useful these kind of findings could be, you know, for us uh, uh, nowadays. Um, so I would very much like to open this up and not have me talk at you <laughs> anymore. So I would love to hear from you. Thank you, Friederike. And as uh, Friederike said, if anyone has any questions, uh, you're either welcome to submit them in the chat box or feel free to just chime in right now, since it is a pretty small, intimate group that we can have a conversation here together. Um, anyone would like to start? I just, I had a quick question. Um, just, it's not so much about resilience, but I was just wondering about the role of, role of the state in all of this. Um, you know, particularly um, the state's management of temporality, if one wants to think of it in those terms. Um, and I was wondering if the state um, in this period in which you conducted your field research um, was emphasizing development on the one hand and forgetting the past on the other um, maybe it had a future orientation, et cetera. Um, and I'm just thinking of that great quote by George Orwell, where he talks about who controls the past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past. So <laughs> I just throw that out there, just thinking about the role of the state um, in its management of temporality. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. And it's, uh, and that is also where, at the particular time when I did my research, that was how both this bottom-up narrative of move, wanting to move on uh, merged with a top-down narrative of, yes, as a state, we also want to move on. And I think one point to make here is that in this conflict, it was a little bit uh, peculiar in that there was no winner so to say, of, of the conflict. So neither of the political parties in, uh, there were two main opposition parties in Sierra Leone at the time, and neither of them was um, particularly connected to one side of the, of the civil war. Uh, so they, they had nothing to gain with, this, uh, uh, with um, uh, emphasizing on, on the, the, the past uh, or the reasons for the, for the rebellion. So the overall narrative was of the president that came in in 2007 
uh, was uh, the previous president might have been an NGO president. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, the, when all of this uh, in, international peace building movement uh, was happening and international organizations were present in Sierra Leone. And then uh, the president in 2007 said, well, I'm going to be the business president and I will uh, bring development to this country. So that was very much uh, communication toward the future. Uh, and and um, this kind of worked out in this time. Uh, there was uh, uh, um, this this was something that I experienced as uh, as a also a very hopeful time. There were um, and it's a very small country, so there were a couple of large mineral companies coming in, and only one company with the kind of jobs that they created was uh, bringing a huge kind of sense of enthusiasm to to people, and this was something that. At times, I felt like I was in, in the Wild West. Uh, I was um, in one of the small areas that M Medina, the first village that I showed you pictures, and there was a huge um, um, a track being built for a train uh, just to transport minerals to the coast for the minerals then to be uh, shipped to South Africa. And people had never seen a train since the 1970s. And so there was this general feeling that things were happening now. So, and of course they, um, uh, this was credited with the government and all of this kind of fell apart years later. So it, it, it unfortunately didn't uh, have, uh, you know, it, 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 in, in the long term now, people see this time very different. But at the time of my research, the, this was the feeling of, you know, now we're moving on. So that was very interesting. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you have a question or comment? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go okay. ahead. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan. I teach here in the Washington area at George Mason University. Um, yeah. If, yeah, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I was wondering if you could address um, some of the critiques that I hear about the word resilience as being rooted in neoliberalism. Um, I think that for, for those of us who are working in peace and conflict studies, um, we tend to think of resilience more sort of in the terms that you're talking about as recovering from trauma. Um, and, um, and perhaps a problematic word, as you said, because we think of it perhaps as a binary or a state opposed to, you know, am I traumatized or am I resilient? But um, one, of the, one of the recurring um, critiques that you hear sort of... Uh, I would say in a, in a more general anthropology sense is, oh, resilience is about um, uh, being able to cope in the infinitely precarious uh, marketplace and you know, self-reinvention and being entrepreneurial and, um, and, and, uh, and bricolage and all of these things. And um, um, I, I hear sort of maybe some kind of echoes um, of that in, in, in what you've said in terms of people saying things like, oh, well, now I have a job and now I can provide for my family or I have hope because of the train. Um, could you address some of those critiques? Um, and um, do, you, do you think about um, that association in your work on resilience? Uh, that's a tough question. So, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I have not worked with the word resilience when I was doing my research. So I think this is something that I also want to keep separate because I want to, what helps me sometimes ground my uh, argument or when I, when I speak, I want to really stick to how things happen and how people describe them themselves. Um, but they, it, many of these strategies fit what uh, we, you know, how we define resilience and how anthropologists define resilience. So I, I completely agree there. Um, with the neoliberal arguments, I think there's a danger uh, of seeing resilience as something that is a collection of certain things that you do or that you can learn. And that if you are not resilient, then you just haven't done that or you just haven't done that work and it's kind of becoming your own problem. And I think that kind of leaves out a lot of open questions 
both on a biological side, which a lot of people don't talk about, that there are certain biological, psychological traits that can, you know, that help some people deal with adversity more than others. Uh, but also it again shifts um, the locus of action to uh, an individual and leaves out the context around the individual and how that context around the individual also has an, uh, a large influence in whether you're able to cope or not. And I think one thing that I might not have emphasized enough in Sierra Leone was that there was a very supporting social uh, web around the people who I describe. So um, when I talk about this, uh, maybe I can give you one example. When I talked about this, people not wanting to think too much, uh, there's, also, uh, there's also this idea that I want to help other people not to think too much. So there was this one uh, example I can give you that we had, uh, I was staying in, uh, in uh, a household in Freetown with two sisters and they had taken in one of their cousins who had recently lost her husband and she was suffering a great deal and she was trying to find a, a new place to live and um, there was this one time when um, she was sitting out on the porch uh, by herself and then one of the sisters uh, she kind of shouted out to me she said go sit go out and sit with her uh, so that she's not going to think too much and uh, and I thought, you know, what do you want me to go, you know, what, what business do I have to talk to this woman? And they, and they said, you don't have to talk, just sit there. So, and this was something where I'm learning how people kind of look out for each other in, in, in ways that we don't always see and that we don't always uh, kind of recognize as outsiders, but it is there. So it also shows us that when somebody says, you know, I'm trying to regulate my thoughts or I'm trying to um control you know what i'm thinking there is a social web around that and that i think you cannot disconnect from you know when we talk about resilience there yeah thank you any other questions or comments uh, i see uh, one from richard go ahead richard See, he has his hand up. Richard, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, wait. I, you're on mute, Richard. Or if, if you want to type in your question in the chat. And I see a couple of questions in the chat. So um, I have a question here from Marietta. She says, um, my question pertains to combatants uh, that, that uh, I mentioned. Does the term combatant include former child soldiers? Um, that's also a very um, interesting question because um, uh, the way Sierra Leoneans or the, the research respondents talked, they didn't use the term combatant. So this is something that I am using. Uh, they uh, would always talk about those who fought. Uh, so that would include everyone and they would also include children um, when they talked about them. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and then there's a second question. Can you speak a little about what you concluded from your work regarding transitional justice? Did you make any conclusions about that? Well, that's also, <laughs> that can fill another presentation. Um, uh, that uh, um, uh, transitional justice in Sierra Leone, I think, is a very interesting case, and it's it, I, I'm finding it hard to to summarize. Um, uh, what I always found remarkable uh, is um, how little interest there was at the time of my research 
in both the institutions, there was a truth commission, and then uh, there was a, 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 the a special court for Sierra Leone, which was a hybrid court, uh, where nine of the most uh, responsible for the violence were tried. And during the time of my research, it was actually um, uh, the time when uh, Charles Taylor was in front of the special court for Sierra Leone. And that trial was uh, done in The Hague. But this was not at all discussed in everyday life in Sierra Leone. And there was even a day when um, he, the verdict would, uh, would be spoken and uh, there were international photographers all over Freetown and they were looking for this one image uh, of Sierra Leoneans, uh, you know, huddling together in front of a TV, watching Charles Taylor, you know, being tried before the, the special court. And he couldn't find anyone because nobody was watching it. And, uh, and this I found really interesting uh, in that there, it, it was perceived as something very far removed from everyday life. So they would say, or many of the respondents would say, uh, this is something that um, international people would do uh, or international organizations are doing. Um, and they are surely doing the right thing. So this was really interesting. But it, it, it didn't uh, come close to the, the, the research participants themselves. So it kind of didn't feel that this was directly connected uh, with people's lives. And it doesn't have to. Nobody says that transitional justice, you know, it's a political process. It doesn't have to touch everyone's, you know, di life in a, di in a direct way. But that's something that I noticed. Uh, that is very different in other places and in other countries so people are um so and this i think has something to do with the kind of violence that happened in sierra leone that people have seen uh, firsthand how chaotic this violence took place and that uh this was um, um uh, that it's hard to uh, actually pinpoint who would be responsible for this and uh so I think there's a lot there that, um, yeah, that, that would be really interesting to discuss here. So if, if you know, you would like to talk more about that, I'm happy to, to, to say more. But those were the, that was the most, um, this disconnect between transitional justice and life uh, was really the, the most, um, yeah, the, the starkest impression that I had in my research. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure that to include Richard in case he has, yes, he has a question. I think I have my audio now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Well, thank you. It's a great talk and um, it's really intriguing. I've done some work that was kind of overlapping, but looking at individuals who uh, failed uh, at migration, international migration, and um, was looking at those that called them so, that were traumatized and ended up in institutional care. So I kind of have a question about how much is your focus in using the term resilience about um, a set of societal um, um, observations or networks or activities, cultural phenomena, how much is it, uh, is it about social units rather than individual actors? And um, just trying to better understand the concept of resilience. And a somewhat related second question is that in the, in the part of this work that I'm familiar with, it's interesting how some individuals and groups respond very differently to the same or different or, or, or very extreme um, challenges in their external world. And you can get people who are very adaptive under crucial situations and those that respond very unfavorably to the same situation. And it's really hard to tease that out as an anthropologist, I think, if I'm clear enough. So those are my two questions. Um. Yes, so I think the interesting, uh, an advantage of resilience as a concept is it, it works 
from the individual through family unit, uh, social group, uh, uh, or uh, any system. So you could use it uh, in any of these dimensions. It's not an individual thing. It, uh, it can, you know, a group can be resilient, a city can be resilient. Um, uh, in my research, I found it the most interesting to see this link between individual and their wider social um, environment or the, the group where, for example, this, this you know, when, when there's an idea that, um, uh, um, how can I say, um, when you perceive yourself as a member of a group, uh, it, it helps you to cope with things individually. And I think in um, a cultural context like Sierra Leone, we also have to be careful when we talk about individuals or sort of the individual uh, thought or the role that your individual emotions play. Uh, we, or what many Western societies, they place a very high um, uh, importance on individual thought and individual emotions. And often in Sierra Leone, I realized that people said, well, I don't feel good about it, but I have to do it because I'm a member of this family or I'm a member of this community. But it didn't mean that they felt as like they didn't feel so bad about it. It was just a matter of fact. And it was something that people didn't think about too much. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I would, you know, with my own background, I would be like, I would be furious. I don't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to do this. I wouldn't want to spend this time uh, doing this for the community or doing this for the family. Uh, why, you know, why would I, you know, put my own priorities under the priorities of the group? But this was not something that was perceived in this way or experienced in this way. And I think that's where we find really interesting um, notions of, you know, I'm, I'm resilient because my family's resilient, things like this, or, you know, so the, yeah. the, those links I find most productive for us to, to think yeah. about. And it, and it avoids the medical model. You don't get trapped in the medical model, which uh, creates a lot of blind sides. And, and even there, we are in the West as well. I mean, uh, it's always, I, I, I would not want to draw this black and white sort of dis distinction. Also, we are part of groups. It's just different uh, to, yeah. you know, to the extent, but it's, it's the same influence as human beings. We are always part of, of you know, larger systems. We, yeah. It's hard to really single out uh, sort of what is individual and whatnot. So, I have now. a question. To what extent did you get any sense that people were, feel, were fearful of a repeat occurrence of violence? That is a, a really interesting question. Uh, not very much. So this was something that I actually asked as a question as well. So I would ask uh, some of the respondents, do you, how secure do you feel that this war is really over? And they, uh, a few of them would say, well, it was kind of a shaky time until the elections of 2007. And uh, Sierra Leone had had elections in 2002, the year right after the war, and then 2007, and they both were peaceful uh, relatively. And, um, and then they said, at that time we knew it was going to be okay. So there, <laughs> I, it's, it's hard to describe this, um, but uh, there was also in, in the villages, it uh, was also that I asked, you know, women or elderly people and they said, uh, um, they, 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 they're not doing anything anymore. They are not touching us anymore because now we are all trying to be one community and to get development. So this was a way of trying to explain to me also that it, it was something of the past. There were even people in, that was more in the location of Medina, the first location uh, in the north of the country where people said, we are one family now. So we are moving as one. Uh, that's how they would describe it. But that's not something I would want to say that that was the same in all locations. Was but, there some police um, or some authority that they felt 
they could contact if somebody started again? Um, one interesting observation that I made was that this was almost, okay, the, the most um, trusted actors in Sierra Leone are actually religious uh, actors and religious leaders. So in a small village, uh, it could happen that if there's a conflict, that this was the, the, the people would, you know, turn to religious leaders. And being a very, anim, how can you say, a normal case of, uh, of religious coexistence. So Sierra Leone has a, a wonderful coexistence of Christianity and, and Islam. Uh, so it would always be a pastor, uh, an imam, uh, and then uh, things would be discussed uh, between them and uh, situations could be calmed down. So I had the impression that in uh, the villages there, there was a very strong social control uh, um, that held the peace. Um, so th this really was a feeling of security, even myself, of security. There was no large amount of insecurity. This was, it was really uh, an interesting experience. Um, also in the years after my research, so I returned again in 2014, I returned again to the country in 2016 and 17. It's a very, feels very safe as a country. So you really wonder sometimes how this kind of brutal violence had taken place and then just kind of um, dissipated with the end of the war. Yeah. I hope it answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would be fearful if I knew somebody had sort of hacked my family. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have a question from Edward. Edward, would you like to uh, ask your question? Uh, sure. Thanks for a great talk, Frederica. Really um, provocative on many counts. I want to go all the way back to the discussion about time and um, how far back in the past something has to occur before it was too long ago to matter anymore. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, um, I'm interested in whether in the course of conversations that you had and talk about development and so forth, um, in an unprompted way, British colonial rule ever came up in the conversation uh, because of course that ended um, certainly in my lifetime um, and in the lifetimes of, uh, of many uh, uh, people who you might have encountered. And I wonder if British colonial rule was too long ago to matter. That's a very, uh, that's a very interesting question. It did not come up at all in the research. So, um, and if uh, it would be a positive thing uh, that people uh, remembered at least the time after uh, the colonial rule um, as, I mean, Sierra Leone had one of these experiences that, that several African countries had that there was actually decline after the, the colonial rule, uh, sort of, sort of socioeconomic decline uh, from very, you know, good status or situation in the 50s and 60s, uh, going worse in the 70s and really bad in the 1980s. So um, this idea of the train, for example, there used to be a train that functioned and that went through the country even to the far uh, further away rural areas. And then that was stopped sometimes in the 80s. Uh, so this is a it's a it's a weird sense of time um, uh, when it comes to those things as well. Um, but in terms of transitional justice, that would also be a really interesting question. Uh, it was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Uh, so they've actually looked at all of the sort of uh, antecedents of the Civil War and how, you know, the seeds and uh, of some conflicts were already sown during colonial rule. But this was not part of everyday discussion. So I found that really, really interesting. Later on, I think we've had uh, in 2014, 15, 16, when things were talking, people, you know, the, the, particularly in Freetown, people would talk more about decolonialism and, and, and things like that. 
that it would come up there, but not in terms of this post-war phase. So I found that also very interesting. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question, a comment from Mariah. Mariah, would you like to share? Yes, hi. If you can hear me, hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I have a couple questions just about revisiting the idea of trauma that you brought up, which was sort of interesting because we've seen before in the post-conflict states that there still tends to be a kind of lingering, um, almost elephant in the room of certain discussions. Like we definitely saw this in Rwanda um, during the apartheid. But I guess I'm curious for the combatants who participated in the war and participated in that genocide, what sort of, what words, what conversations were being had about sort of restorative justice? Um, we know that like resilience, you've kind of mentioned, wasn't a thing of a personal onus that someone had to take upon themselves, but communally, were we seeing sort of, were you seeing any special considerations for the, what I'll call trauma, um, especially relationally between the groups of people who had been victims or lost their family and the people who participated what was, was there a sort of tension that you noticed and moving forward, how were you able to observe any sort of, um, just to throw a word out there, kind of resolutions, if not resilience? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that question. That's really, uh, that's good. Um, so uh, one really interesting point uh, in, the, in, in this Sierra Leonean situation is that some of the, um, interventions that were done by uh, NGOs or local um, organizations, uh, they focused on that, on, um, on uh, uh, reconciliation uh, between civilians and former combatants. Uh, so for example, there at the time of my research, uh, there was a local uh, NGO uh, that was performing reconciliation ceremonies and it would be really interesting that during those ceremonies, uh, some of this coexistence that was before going rather smoothly uh, was then, th there was sort of this one event where it was allowed to speak up and people would, uh, would use that as well. Uh, and uh, so, for example, in, in the town of, uh, or the village of Tongodu, which was the second research location, uh, at the time when I was there, people were still talking about one of those reconciliation ceremonies. Uh, and um, uh, one thing that really bothered civilians uh, about that reconciliation ceremony was that they allowed a, per a perpetrator, a really high ranking perpetrator to talk to them uh, in front of the group. And uh, they didn't feel that that was something that they should have uh, allowed or they should have given him a stage to talk to them. And they were really angry about that. Uh, but, and this triggered a lot of discussions. So then uh, I, I could pick that up in my research and I said, okay, now this is a really interesting case. And how do you feel about this? And then they said, you know, if it's like this, we don't want others to bring these topics up. Then we just want to rather continue the way that we're living. Uh, but I think in the end, those were really fruitful interventions, even if um, they uh, didn't always go well. Uh, because periodically, I think it helps to reflect on this. And uh, I don't think that these kind of ceremonies have really brought reconciliation in the way that they hoped uh, to, to um, bring it to these uh, communities. But... Um, uh, it was a space where some things could be said that in an ordinary village day you cannot speak about or you cannot say there would be no forum to discuss these issues. So some uh, so-called victims, uh, right, they, they have a space to talk to the community and then they could have, they could say something and then that would be settled or that would be said, in, in, not settled, said. And um, so I think it's interesting to look what to to observe what happens in those spaces, uh, and um, but I don't think that that um, 
I think that the actual reconciliation or the actual living in coexistence is happening in everyday life. I think that's, I think if that's the most crucial arena where, where this can take place. Um, uh, that's at least the impression that I had. Um, does this answer your question, Maria? Oh yes, thank you. I was just really following up. You, so you said something that was really clarifying regarding um, kind of looking outside of what social supports, what kind of ecosystem is there. And it's difficult because I am sort of projecting the ideas of what trauma-informed um, analyses look like, which is hard because I don't want to say, is there a space for healing? Because I'm also sensing not an erasure, but kind of a protective honestly, an acknowledgement of the things that occurred in the past to sort of move on. But it's interesting, there's also this response also as well to these um, constructed environments to talk about it, but it just depends on who's narrating that occurrence. So I find those to kind of be at odds with each other. So I was interested, which obviously you answered, thank you so much about what that looks like moving forward to heal, but then also having to consistently re-engage with that um, where appropriate audiences kind of own the narrative to do so. And I think that was, um, I guess, again, looking at a trauma-informed approach, I was curious if that is a lens for which you kind of had to sit in, or was it just we're not considering that idea as psychosocial, we're considering almost as a, a social phenomenon to move forward, therefore, I guess, i.e. be resilient. So thank you so much for answering that question. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much for asking. And I think it's also... Um, interesting to think about what can happen in an informal way and what can happen in a formal way and what kind of things are more um, are more suited to one or the other arenas so i think that's also something that really depends on the context and depends on what actually happened in in the context we have a question from uh, alexandra alexandra would you like to share next I think she also wrote it in the chat. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, can you speak to how media and art interacted with the violence, if any? Did they tend to focus on the concept of development and healing? Did any focus on performing for outsiders? That is, I think, um, I'm not feeling very comfortable in answering this question because I think that's something that I haven't really noticed as much or have looked for as much as I could have. I think um, uh, many of these NGO interventions would also have media and, and art um, dimensions to them. So, um, well, not just NGO, but the general, the interventions. Uh, for example, the, the Truth Commission had asked um, Sierra Leonean children to paint pictures about the future of the country. So I think that was one, they, I think they call it the vision project. Well, don't cite me on that. But, um, and then they put up those pictures in the hallways of the Truth Commission office where nobody actually went but that it was there i saw it and now um they're in in a uh, peace museum uh that was put up in, in freetown um so i think that is some kind of visionary exercise to look into the future through art um and um there there's also a really interesting article or chapter by um rosalind shaw on how young people in Freetown have used theater plays to relive or kind of reshape their experiences of um, the war uh, and of uh, reaching sort of a personal development, uh, moving on in, in life uh, personally. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting work. And um, there was also one more instance that I thought was really interesting in moving this focus toward the future at the time, in 2012, when I uh, was there the second time, there was a Sierra Leonean action movie that came out. And that was um, one of the 
backdrop uh, um, scenes in the movie was actually Civil War, and it looked a lot like the Sierra. It was, you know, it was it staged a lot like the Sierra Leonean Civil War. So they had a rebel group that was, you know, fighting as in a in a village and then capturing and and hurting civilians. Uh, but this entire uh, um, but that was basically the background of the film that then kind of developed in a wholly different way it was about the army commander finding his love and, and you know things like that but the interesting thing about that movie I thought was that there was a, 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 a preface by the director so when you it even like I was watching this in a context of the family showing so I, it was really part of the movie so you couldn't skip the preface so we first had this director speak to us how amazing it is that it is now possible to do action movies in Sierra Leone and this is part of development you know and it's part of you know we can be proud of you know developing and becoming more like a, a, a more developed country and, uh, and then he was saying how difficult it was to get all of these scenes and uh, shot with together with the army and how to get the fatigue, you know, uh, to play the scenes in the movie. And so with that preface, we were looking at the movie thinking, oh, it's a Sierra Leonean action movie. And not so much, oh, it's reminding us of the war. So I thought that was really an interesting way of, you know, reframing a whole a uh, scene that could otherwise raise kind of traumatic memories, but now it was kind of like, no, no, but we're doing an action movie and we're actually using our experience uh, that, that we can do this. I thought it was really interesting and, and, and people were like, oh yeah, that's how it was. Uh, this, this is how it, how it took place. So there was not a, a negative connotation with watching this movie. It was more like, oh yes, this happened to all of us. So I found that really uh, a remarkable scene uh, during my research. Yeah. We have a question from Jonathan. Jonathan, you want to share? Yeah, thank you for, for calling me a, a calling on me again. And I apologize for having a second question. It's just that I'm very interested. No, no need to apologize. <laughs> you're, you're eager. Go ahead. Okay. So um well before I get to my question, do you do you remember uh Frederica the title of that film? Because it sounds amazing. Uh, particularly um, if somebody hasn't already written this paper. I mean, in, in, it would be an amazing comparison and contrast to Blood Diamond, that film with uh, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know what I mean? Um, so if anybody out there is looking for a paper subject, um, <laughs> do you remember the, uh, do you not remember the title of it? I do, I do. it's called State Crime. State Crime. From 2012. Oh, perfect. Should probably be available somewhere in the local, or maybe even online. I'm not sure, but uh, if if not, I'll go to Sierra Leone and get a burn DVD. I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but my real question was um, just a um, a really uh, basic one. Could you tell us a little bit more about your um, methodology? You mentioned that there was a translation issue with the word encouraged and discouraged. What language were the interviews happening in? Did you have a translator? How did you pick your um, your interviewees? Um, did you have a questionnaire? Did you ask everyone the same questions, more or less? Um, I'm just um, I'm I'm interested in hearing more about that sort of basic ethnographic method stuff. Yes, uh, and it's actually my fault of not having gone into that uh, a lot deeper. And I think that's uh, something that uh, is really important to know. So um, in the three research locations, uh, there were, so Sierra Leone has a lingua franca, which is Creole, which is kind of an English-based Creole uh, that is spoken in all of uh, the locations in Sierra Leone, but in the more rural locations, people are not comfortable speaking in this language. So when I was in Medina, uh, we were, I was working together with a research assistant a young university student uh, named Ishiatu Kuruma and we both lived together in the village for a period of six to six weeks and then kind of frequently returned and um, we would hold interviews in the language there Timni uh, uh, and then she would uh, uh, translate uh, it during the interview 
uh, and a similar, I use a similar strategy in Tambudu, which is another language spoken there. Uh, Kono is the local language there, and I worked with uh, another uh, local uh, research assistant, uh, um, Doris Levy, and she um, was uh, she lived in in the nearby city there, and. Uh, um, also there we translated right on the spot uh, back and forth and in Freetown by the time that I was in Freetown most many people spoke actual English in Freetown so I could um, converse with them uh, in English and then by the time in 2012 when I returned I was you know dabbling a little bit in that Creole language as well so it was back and forth so I didn't use a research assistant for the interviews in Freetown I roughly followed a similar question sort of topic areas. So I would talk about how people feel, whether they're affected from the violence or it still affects them sort of in their everyday life now. And I would ask about uh, the relationship between combatants and civilians. That was often the question that we talked about, uh, whether this is something that's relevant to them or not. Uh, but sometimes uh, then we would go into very different areas of, t of, you know, talking about different topics. So it was uh, open interviews uh, throughout the research. Uh, everything was transcribed together with the research assistants. And um, so you used a tape recorder. I, I, most of the times we used the tape recorder and then we transcribed it together from the tape recorder. So and how did, how did you get people's trust to ask these kinds of very intimate questions? So uh, in Medina, in that uh, smaller village, uh, it was us sort of living there for this period of time. There were 21 houses, so at some point we said, we're just going to talk with everyone. Uh, so we're going to talk with everyone in like each house, we would just come and visit everyone because it's also, it, there were, I mean, you're right, it's, it's, it raises a lot of suspicions. And then, you know, we try to do interviews outside as well, because people, um, it's not appropriate to go into a house and then sit there sort of hidden away from everybody else. You know, people would be wondering, what are they talking about? And these aren't so sensitive issues I learned. It's really interesting. Sometimes people would talk about, you know, how they are affected of the war uh, or how they are suffering or how they, you know, how they try to manage to go on. And then other people would come and sit down during the interview, just sit with us and listen. And it wasn't a problem. So I think that was also something that at some point um, in, in Medina, somebody said to everybody else, oh, she's just asking questions about the war. So <laughs> it's, it was like, she's not having anything, you know, weird. So, oh, it's just, you know, you just have to tell her what, what you felt during the war. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I don't know. So that was an impression that I had. In uh, the east of the country, in Tambordu, things were uh, a little bit more tense when we spoke with former combatants because they would sometimes be uh, organized in groups, uh, being taxi drivers or motor bike drivers. Uh, and, the, and there was some... Uh, um, so at one, I remember one interview, for example, my research assistant, she didn't feel comfortable uh, um, speaking to the group. Uh, so we had, uh, or not speaking to the group, but sort of she said she was happy that we left at, at the time. Uh, I think that was the only time where we had a situation that we kind of had to talk about afterwards, uh, whether this was okay or not, and whether this was also something that was useful for the research to, um, to have done that interview. Um, but uh, yeah, so... Uh, it was also, uh, and I, I wrote about this a lot in, in uh, my PhD then, in Tombodu, in the uh, village in the east of the country, there was a little bit more suspicion because there had been a lot of uh, NGO work done in, in that village before, and not all of that was positively um, perceived. And also because it was a very important um, 
village in the sort of in how the war happened it was uh, a lot of the witnesses for the the, the, tr the tribunal for the the hybrid court actually originated from Tomburu. so people were a lot uh, familiar with researchers and uh, journalists coming there and asking questions and there was more there was more suspicion and there was more i had one time i had an I had a, a situation where somebody complained about me not giving out enough money for interview or um, sort of paying money for interview to some people and not to others. So this was, uh, these, these, were, these were discussions and sort of points of, um, points of uh, conflict. Yeah. Forgive me, so you were giving money to your interviewees? Uh, no, 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 but this was sort of the suspicion. I see. That you know, that people would be, you know, either I would not be giving money for interviews uh, and that would be seen as not fair because people are spending their time. Uh, or they would say, you know, I'm favoring a few people and why aren't you going to the other people and interview mm. them as well and give them a job as well. You know, so in, a, in, a, in an economically, you know, str yeah. struggling region, this is a huge issue. And of course. Uh, but we, we were, you know, helping people out with, with things, but not just interviewees. So this, uh -huh. this, it's, it's, I don't know, it's very hard to explain how you get entangled in when you, you know, eat at a certain family's home, you can't, like, it's customary to give, you know, for mm -hmm. the food and stuff. So th these are things that, um, yeah, they're always difficult when you are in a, a village uh, right. of the size as Tomadu, for example, and then uh, who do you speak with? And then mm -hmm. is that a disadvantage or an advantage for the person? So it's, it's very difficult to do that. And mm -hmm. that's also where I felt most uncomfortable as a researcher, uh, you know, being confronted with this question of, you know, what, what benefit is actually my research to the people here? Yeah, exactly. So, it's kind of that still kind of sits there as yeah. being very extractive, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. And my, my last comment, this is not a question, but yeah, the, the reason I'm asking this is because I'm um, preparing if Corona ever ends um, to, um, to uh, conduct some interviews um, with victims of violence in Eastern Congo which is kind of um, colored by the culture of suspicion in Rwanda with the sort of military dictatorship there and a, and a very entrenched orthodoxy about what you can and can't say about the genocide. Um, it sounds like things are different in Sierra Leone, but, um, but anyway, I just wanted to garner that kind of um, very human experience as a researcher that you had. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a question from Matt. Matt, would you like to share, please? Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meath, for, for your presentation. Um, so I am uh, I'm a military veteran. Uh, so some of what you're saying about resilience, you know, at least on an anecdotal, anecdotal level, uh, really does resonate a lot with me. Uh, I do have some experience with trauma and grief. And... Uh, you know, in, in my experience, uh, like you said, it is not, uh, you know, a stage by stage process. It's not a linear, uh, it's not a linear process at all. It, it's very cyclical. Uh, so to me, um, there's always been this sense of, I, uh, you know, if you describe it in the, the five stages of grief, the, that trope, uh, I just want to stay in acceptance as, as much as possible, which I think uh, when you talk about the term resilience is a good way to describe that. Resilience is how well you are able to stay in that acceptance stage, knowing that you're going to flip between the other stages at, at any given time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, very, very interesting idea about resilience. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I also had a question. Uh, I was deployed to Kosovo, and uh, Kosovo is an ethnic conflict um, that while... <sighs> While I was there and some period of time before I was there, uh, the conflict was often played out uh, in terms of uh, arson, uh, specifically of the burning of Serbian churches, uh, because Serbian churches were seen as kind of the, the connection of the Serbian people to the land. So my question, uh, you've said that largely uh, the conflict was not 
was not violent while you were there, but did you find that uh, there were conflicts that played out in other ways? Uh, you may have alluded to it a little bit, um, almost in, in what you were describing with, uh, you know, some of the suspicion and some of the, the fam well, you, you're going to eat with them, but you haven't eaten with us, you know, that, that kind of, like, were you kind of a, a, a chess piece in, in some of those, those conflicts? Um, yes, uh, thank you for asking that question. And that um, allows me to clarify that a little bit. So uh, I think one of the difficulties of describing a situation like Sierra Leone is that um, there are no clear lines there between even who is a combatant, was a combatant, and who was not a combatant, and who was a civilian, and who was not a civilian. Uh, there, um, sometimes people wouldn't know about what a person did during the war because many people were displaced and then returned to their villages. So when you return to the village, then nobody would know where you would have been during the, during the time of violence. Uh, but then also people had these, um, uh, because so many of the fighters were captured, there is this problem of, you know, describing were you now a uh, rebel or were you captured and forced to fight? You know, whose fault is this? And, and you know, there was really a lot of um, blurriness there between, you know, different kinds of combatants. And then also, you know, with child soldiers, you have this this problem, you know, how how much of, uh, you know, of the action is, you know, you know, controlled by this, by the person, you know. Uh, so I think um, whether this played out or not, I think in my research, uh, I think mostly in, in Tombodou and in the large cities, I saw that people inhabit different spaces. So um, there would be, you know, groups of, of young men not all of which of whom would be former combatants, but then they would have their own way of um, hanging out together, working together as drivers, as motor motorbike drivers, for example, and then living uh, close to each other or uh, having sharing social space. Uh, and then, so there was some, some kind of uh, geographical division sometimes, but at the same time, you would have former combatants fully living together with, uh, civilians. Uh, so it was really very a mixed picture that that I found uh, and um, which I think was good is good in the end. So uh, it allowed people to live uh, to uh, yeah to be able to avoid each other if they can but also <laughs> excuse me but also interact if they want. I remember one particular story that was told to me what I thought was really almost comical but it kind of showed this weird kind of um, uh, how you know how a victim and a perpetrator is also they're they're familiar with each other so I remember a, a woman who uh, whose sons were beaten by rebels and uh, one of them was captured and she was telling me the story how she went to a marketplace with one of her sons who was captured by the rebels and they met the actual rebel commander or the person um, who uh, beat her son during the war and that man was harmless and uh, he came up to them and he said can you buy me some food and then, you know, and then, uh, or do you remember me? And then she's like, yes, I remember you. Uh, can you buy me some food? Uh, so, and then she, she said, yes. So then I bought him some food and then he left. And then he said, thank you and left. And, um, and so these kind of chance encounters, and then also, you know, there's a social order there. You know, when somebody begs you for food, you give food when you, you know, are able to. And then in that case, it was kind of like, but then she did it in the end and she told it in such a matter of fact voice. Uh, you know, it was really, it was interesting uh, to me to hear that, but it also shows how people kind of also based on the situation decide. So it's not, uh, 
a priori, you know, I think about people like this, and this is my opinion, and I'm never changing my opinion. It's like when you actually are confronted with a situation, your reaction can be situational. So I think that's, uh, in a context like Sierra Leone, it's so blurry that you couldn't make a, a real statement about this, um, which is really interesting. And I think it's a when you have ideological conflicts where it's also clear who belongs to which side, that's very different. Uh, thank you. And just kind of as a follow-up, do you think um, some of that murkiness was, uh, was deliberate? No, nah, I think it was more the way this violence happened was more by chance. So okay. I, wouldn't know, I wouldn't know deliberate by whom. So it was really um, in some ways also, um, in, it, it, it's an advantage for people there that things weren't um, used in an ideological way, that there were no clear sides that ever developed. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I have one um, from Mariah. Mariah, would you like to share? Hi, yes, thank you again for the second question. I just had a pretty simple question regarding um, when you encountered, particularly in the region you just named, when you, in, when you attempted to sort of gain trust, did you find any people who had, I don't know if they identified as combatants, but whatever side they participated in, did you find, um, any kind of resistance from that particular group if they self-identified and or in your questionnaires or the way you sort of sussed out information, did you specifically ask for people to identify that information and then proceed with the same questions? Um, and what kind of you know, observations, if any, did you glean from that? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, that's also great. Um, uh, great question. Uh, I did not ask people to self-identify, so we tried to learn about this when we were speaking with people and when they sort of told their own story. And sometimes it was really interesting because sometimes people would, um, we would find out during the interview that it was actually a former combatant, but uh, then, you know, like it wasn't always clear in the beginning. And um, we did not have so many different questions. So the questions were mostly in a, in a similar fashion. And, uh, but there was some resistance uh, occasionally in interviews where we thought, okay, maybe this person was a combatant, but they don't want to tell us. And they would sort of answer questions as if they were a civilian. Uh, or they would just uh, say, we as Sierra Leoneans. And, um, we didn't push on that side so then this was just how the interview would go uh, and sometimes you would never know so it's and that's also reflecting the actual situation so in some places people would never know particularly in cities uh it was really like let me give you one um one uh incident i was talking with a neighbor in freetown and then he was uh we were sitting on the veranda and then some young guy comes uh, past the, the, the veranda and he greets and then the neighbor greets back and then he said, see, that was a combatant. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I thought that was, you know, it was really interesting because I thought it was, you know, in the neighborhood where I lived, there were no former combatants. And then he said, yes, but then, you know, some are here. And, uh, and he says, see, they greet us, we greet them. So it's kind of like he was using that as an example of, but it's working, you know? So it's kind of this, these things happen then during the interviews. And that's kind of uh, really interesting to see playing out live. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's pretty interesting too. Just um, if we're talking about resilience, I guess I would always assume that's for the, again, sort of projecting a Western idea of the victims. Um, but I was just curious to know in your work, if ever at any point you noticed the sort of dichotomy, divorcing resilience, not from just victims, but for combatants, if in fact 
which is difficult because I think they could also assume victimhood of certain, you know, state actions and pressure and almost, I would even go as far as saying a sort of indentured slavery to perform in these ways, regardless of the sort of situation um, in war. But I was curious to see if there was any ideas of kind of pressing on, especially for people who are combatants and pressing on for people who are victims, or as to your earlier story, people who are combatants really don't have the right to discuss it at all. But again, that's, of course, being able to identify who those people are. And that could be a little difficult if people just don't talk about it. So I was just wondering how people were able to delineate between those people, which apparently they just can. They just know, I guess. (laughs) They walk by and they know. Um, That must have been, I I don't know if that was um, a compounding factor in your research, but I just wanted to know if that's something you engage with. Thank you. Yeah, I think to really answer your question, I would, I don't have, I haven't talked to enough people who have self-identified as combatants. I think that's really something that I wouldn't be able to answer uh, in any way that would be representative. I mean, none of my research is representative for Sierra Leone, but but, um, there were certainly ideas of people who did too much. Uh, so this combatant that the people in the village complained about, that he spoke to them, he, they said, you know, he did too much, he was too evil, so he should not be allowed to talk to us. But this was not applied to, let's say, ordinary fighters or some of the boys who would be captured and then you would have performed violence. So there was certainly an idea of some people were too bad and they should remain silent. And, um, and I spoke with a few people who were combatants who said, you know, by gradually adjusting to life um, uh, in the village, for example, in one case, uh, they would become and show themselves to become normal members of society. So I think there were some of the strategies like that. But um, I, it was not that large of a focus of my research uh, uh, so that I could really make a statement on, on your question. So let me think if I can uh, maybe come up with somebody who has worked on that more, uh, more in, in depth. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, uh, we have a f- just a few minutes left unless there are any final short questions or comments within the remaining four minutes we have. Um, We're going to wrap it up. And um, at the very least, I want to say very much, uh, many thanks to Friederike. It's almost 3 a.m. in Germany right now. (laughs) Um, But this has certainly been an enlightening conversation and really appreciate you sharing your research. And And I think for myself speaking, there are certain points here that I definitely can take away uh, to apply to current issues that are rather unsettling to focus on so that um, there is hopefully a a brighter future to uh, shoot for. So I don't see any final questions. I'm gonna quick double check to make sure there aren't any hands raised that I'm missing. couple of comments but uh yeah yeah um some comments uh um bill already signed off but he references uh the um work by stephen fox on trauma and psychological among uh, refugees during the decade uh so if um that mainly focused on how um the advice was to focus on the things that you have control over versus those that you cannot change or have control over. Um, Rather relevant. So um, I think, I don't see anything else from anyone, but I also want to thank all of our audience members for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to have you here with us in virtual land and to make sure that your voices are heard for a great dialogue and exchange of learning. So thank you as well to all of you. And I hope you'll be able to join us for our next event in January. We're finalizing the details, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, You will be receiving email updates on those um, coming uh, events for the year.